Good morning, Faith family. We're so glad you ventured out this morning. You made the time change. You braved the slushy morning. Welcome to the House of Friends. My name is Pastor Trey. Let's stand together as we bring praise and worship to Jesus Christ this morning. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones I try with all of my mind But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so, so long to my old friends burden and bitterness you just keep it moving now nah, you ain't welcome here from now till I walk streets of gold I see you Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. 
What looks to me like a weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Welcome to Liberty Church. We're very thankful that you have chosen to join us today. If you're a guest with us, we would like to meet you, so please stop by the information desk in the lobby and we will answer any questions you have about Liberty. Make sure to pick up a small gift we have for you to thank you for being our guest. For those of you joining us online, check out our website for more information and to learn about opportunities to connect with us at Liberty. I have a couple of quick reminders for you this morning. Remember, we have our Next Steps class on Sunday, March 19th. If you're interested in learning more about the mission of Liberty and how to get more involved, I encourage you to sign up right away. Also, stay in touch with all the upcoming Easter events through our website and through our Facebook and Instagram pages. This is such an exciting time as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and take time to share the good news of Jesus with others. Make sure you invite your friends, coworkers, and neighbors to all these special events. Finally, I want to thank you for your continued financial support of the Ministries of Liberty. You can make contributions through our website, Church Center app, or by placing your contributions in one of the boxes on the wall as you exit the Worship Center. 
These gifts allow us to spread the love of Christ to our community and around the world. Now let's continue worshiping God and praising Jesus with our worship arts team.
I don't wanna be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't wanna be afraid. I don't wanna be afraid. And I don't wanna fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't wanna fear the storm. I don't wanna fear the storm. Cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid And I'm not gonna fear the storm You are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm Thank you for your great love and your great mercy. We give you all the praise this morning. All God's people said, amen, amen. Let me invite you to find a seat this morning. Good morning, guys. How are we this morning? Good to see you. Thanks, Worship Arts team, for leading us this morning. Wonderful time of worship today. Um, this first, the first service this morning, um, I could tell the people were a bit sleepy. Uh, you guys a little more awake? Can I hear you a little bit out there? All right, that's good. That's good. I can't see, but I can hear you. That's wonderful. Um, this morning, we're privileged to have Dr. Bill Corver speak for us this morning. 
Uh, Pastor Andrew is away, so be praying for him as he's traveling. Uh, we're excited uh, for Dr. Corver. He's been here many times before. He's the president of Carolina College of Biblical Studies down in Fayetteville. Uh, he served here as interim pastor uh, prior to Pastor Andrew coming here uh, 15 years ago. Dr. Corver also has led us in many uh, Bible study classes here on the campus, how to study the Bible. There's one going on actually right now. So uh, just a lot of connections there with CCBS. We enjoy uh, seeing young men and women come to know the Lord and go study at CCBS so that they can go out and uh, spread the good news through a variety of different ministry opportunities, whether it's in uh, student ministry or preaching or a variety of other ways. So we're very thankful to have him here this morning. So Dr. Corr, if you'd come up, give him a warm liberty welcome, if you would. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> well, it's a delight to be with you all. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Liberty supports the college, has for quite a few years, so we're grateful for your support financially. Uh, we could not do what we do without churches and individuals supporting the college, so thank you for that. Uh, I didn't tell the first service this, slipped my mind. Uh, this year, the college celebrates our 50th anniversary as a ministry, and this coming week, uh, we're doing a big celebration banquet, and God worked together all the details for that, so we're going to try to make uh, him look famous and us kind of get out of the way when we celebrate 50 years of his faithfulness and kind of envision what might happen <clears throat> in the coming 50 years if Jesus doesn't return first. Part of our uh, connection with Liberty, Randall Wheeler, is Randall here? Let's see, Randall. Randall is, uh, serves on our president's cabinet, and uh, Jim Rickman serves on our board of directors, so we're grateful for their service. I was reminded in the first service, after the first service, a, a young lady came up to me and said, uh, my, your, your favorite, uh, one of your favorite students is my husband, which kind of, which one of my favorite students. But I'll tell you three of them that graduated from our CCBS that are all connected with uh, Liberty. Daniel Abraham, uh, Grant Lebowski, and Josh Bovey all graduated from the school, have uh, connections here at uh, CCBS. Anyway, <clears throat> you did not come here to hear about the college, did you? Here's the, here's the deal. You can actually talk in my sermon, okay? So did you come here to hear about the college? Great. If you did, you have a very boring life. You came here to hear about Jesus and a word, get a word from the Lord, yes? Okay. So here's our topic for this morning. Our topic is uh, trusting God in uncertain times. I would think you'd agree with us that we live in very uncertain times. <clears throat> uh, about two or three years ago, you could easily stop in any gas station and buy gas for $1.80 a gallon, and quicker than you could fill up your tank three times, it went to $4. You remember those days? Okay. It's uh, like, wow, what are we going to do with gas prices around here? And uh, I kind of laugh. In late 2019, early 2020, Preachers around the United States and maybe the world, but around the United States, were doing these sermon series on vision casting in 2020. We got 2020 vision, right? And then COVID hit. <laughs> it's like, who saw that one coming, right? <laughs> if they did, they didn't preach about it. Anyway, so this uncertain times. Wow, that's where we are. And when we live in uncertain times, here's what happens. We tend to kind of just hunker down and do nothing or, you know, kind of like try to play it safe. We're not going to go there, but in Matthew 6, Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In Matthew 6, Jesus said to the disciples and others listening, stop being anxious, because that's what we tend to do. And he said, you get anxious about two things. And here's what I love about the Bible. It's uh, 2,000 or more years old, and it's just as appropriate today as it was when it was written. And here's what Jesus said people got anxious over. The future and your finances. And guess what you get anxious over? your future and your finances. You don't pick one or the other, it's both, right? And he says, stop it. That's what we tend to do. So in these, uh, uh, these uh, tumultuous times we live in, uncertain times, what does this extraordinary God of the Bible that we worship, what does he do? Well, he, he uses ordinary people like us to pull off some amazing things. So here's what I'd like you to do. You still use your Bible here at Liberty. 1 Kings chapter 17. Turn to 1 Kings 17. 
hope to answer the question, uh, what should we do in the midst of uncertain times? All right? So 1 Kings 17, uh, as Pastor Brian was saying, I have taught the class how to study the Bible here at Liberty a few times over the years. So if any of my former students are in the class, or former students are here today, uh, you've heard this phrase a lot of times, context is king. That's what's going on in the story. So here's the person in the story. That's a guy named Elijah. We're told in James, we're not going to go there, but James chapter 5, just kind of a little bitty passing word about Elijah. James says this about him, <clears throat> that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And the word he uses there basically means this, that Elijah was cut out of the same bolt of cloth that we are. He struggled with the same things we do. He got happy about the same things we do. He, he was not some extraordinary, you know, unbelievable person. He was just ordinary like us. Now, did you wake up this morning an hour earlier than you normally do to be told you're just ordinary? Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but guess what? You're just like me. You're kind of ordinary, all right? But the great news is we have this extraordinary God who can do great things, okay? That's what's going on in the story. Elijah, by the way, in the Bible, names meant something that are, and it was usually very significant. Elijah's name means my God is Yahweh or my God is Jehovah. He lives his entire life that way. He just, God's a great God. I'm just an ordinary guy, but I, can, I serve this great God. So 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, <clears throat> here's my first point, and then we'll read the scriptures, okay? In, in uncertain times, trust God. There it is. In uncertain times, trust God. Look at verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Kirith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Kirith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought to him bread in the, and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, so he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Rise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And when he had come to the gate of the city, behold, a w widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may, be, that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives. But notice she didn't say the Lord my God. The Lord your God lives. I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. Behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go and prepare it for me and my son. That we may eat it and die. <clears throat> and Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go do as I have said, but, as, but make me the little cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward you shall make one for yourself and your son. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor the jar of oil be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. <clears throat> so she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. So in uncertain times, trust God. So the first thing God says to Elijah is, go to Kirith. Okay? It's a little brook. And I hear in the south what we might call it a creek, right, or a creek. Just go to this creek. Makes sense. You've got to have something to drink, right? Absolutely. Well, after a while, obviously, what happens in droughts to streams? Y'all are good. You can a little more can participation. Okay, they tend to dry up. So the stream dries up. He has no, no water. So the Lord says, uh, now I want you to go to destination B. So you go to Zarephath. Now, would you admit that most of us are biblically, geographically challenged? Okay. Uh, if I said, we're going to have a quiz today, where is Kirith? You'd say, oh, I don't know. And where's Zarephath? I don't know that one either. Okay. Uh, so look at uh, verse uh, 9. <clears throat> Arise, go to Zarephath. And then what does your Bible say next? Which belongs to who? Sidon. Again, we're geographically challenged. Okay, what, what in the world is that? Zarephath, and it's in this land called Sidon. Okay. Well, go back maybe half a page or a page in your Bible to chapter 16, verse 31. <clears throat> By the way, the king of the day 
uh, in Israel was a guy named Ahab. He was a terrible king. He's married to Jezebel, who was the worst queen Israel ever had. I'm pretty sure you've never met a young lady or a woman named Jezebel, and people stop naming girls that because of this lady. Okay? 1631. And it came about as though it was a trivial thing for him, that's Ahab, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the who? Sidonian. Now remember, when you fast forward to 17.9, that's where Elijah's told to go, Sidon. In other words, he's saying, Elijah, you've gone into the presence of the king, verse 1, Ahab, and told him, no rain. By the way, for an agricultural society, this is like a death knell. <laughs> there will be no rain for years. You get to verse 9, he says, no, now Elijah, do this. Go back to, go to that place where, your father, where Ahab's father-in-law is king. It would be like going to like enemy territory. Wow. So go to Kirith. Brook dries up. Oh, now, now go to Zarephath. Got it. Bad place to be. We might say, wrong side of the tracks. Now, at Liberty, and in this community, a lot of folks are military, yes? Okay, I mean, y'all are come by the time you get warmed up, the service will be over, all right? <laughs> and so, I've never been military, all right? Always a respect for military, but I was too young for Vietnam and too old for the other stuff, all right? Uh, but here's what I know. There are certain places that most military people say you don't want a PCS there. Let me give you a few. Fort Polk. <laughs> First service, the same thing happened. Here's what I know about Fort Polk. I've never been there. If you like to hunt and fish, great. But if you don't like crawdads and gators and mosquitoes and you like civilization, wrong place to go. <laughs> Oklahoma, Fort Sill. I've known a lot of people over the years who went through Fort Sill. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. Fort Huachuca, okay? And for some who don't want to shovel snow in June, Fort Drum, okay? Here's the point. <laughs> Sometimes God sends you to a place you're thinking, why am I here? Now, even if you're not military, some of you all have been in jobs, been in geographies that you're thinking, God, why did you send me here? Here's a thought. In uncertain times, God says, Trust me on this one. Trust me on this one. Okay. A couple questions. This, these are rhetorical. It means you answer in your heart. Don't answer out loud. How has God commanded you, yet you're struggling to obey? And it'll be almost always in one of two areas. Your future, a step that he wants you to take. Maybe your job, enrolling in a local Bible college. There's one I could tell you about after the service, uh, whatever, or something related to finances. Maybe it's giving more generously, cutting back in a certain area. I don't know what it is, but here's what I do know. I know human nature, and some, maybe even many, are saying, oh, <laughs> God, I'm not sure I can trust you on that one. In uncertain times, they're uncertain to us. They are not uncertain to God. In uncertain times, and here's what God says to you. Trust me on this one. And Elijah did. By the way, the widow did too. But what will you do? And second question or statement. Could it, could it be that the uncertainty in your life is God's way of revealing to you either a lack of trust in Him or a need to grow in that trust? Maybe you're, you're kind of taking some steps, but you need to take a couple more in trusting Him. What is it He's challenged you, told you to do, that you're struggling with. You're going to trust Him or not? Well, you know, when we do trust Him, if and when we do trust Him, certain things happen. Here's my second point. In uncertain times, God provides in the most unusual ways. I'll say it again. In uncertain times, I'll say it in lecture a little bit different. As we obey, God provides in the most <clears throat> unusual ways. Look back to verse 4. Here's what the Lord said to Elijah. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook. Now, nothing unusual about that, is there? I mean, we don't drink from brooks, but in the day, nothing unusual, right? Okay. 
But then the second half of the verse, and I have commanded ravens to provide for you there. Now, Elijah, remember, James tells us he's a man with a nature like ours. Put yourself in Elijah's shoes. Instead of saying Elijah's name, he says your name. He says, uh, go camp out by Anderson Creek. And I got a couple of red tail hawks. They're going to swoop down morning and evening, drop a couple of chicken nuggets on you. Right? Now, here's what I know. <laughs> I've always been a fan of birds of prey. Watch them, you know, from a distance and all that. Uh, sometimes they get roadkill. Sometimes they catch stuff, you know, a rabbit or a squirrel or whatever. You know, I, I hate to tell you this. I'm 63 years old. And in 63 years on planet Earth, I have never had a bird of prey drop a nugget on me. <laughs> 63. He says, that's going to happen twice a day. Okay. I would say that's kind of like unusual. Well, all right. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 9. By the way, verse 8, excuse me, 6 tells us the ravens brought him bread and meat morning and evening. Twice a day. Great. Well, of course, you know the story. The, the brook dries up. So, so God said, well, go to location B. Verse 9. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Jezebel's dad's the king there. And there, excuse me, and stay there. And behold, I have commanded a widow to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. Well, you know the story. Uh, we just read it. So this, this woman, whose name is never given in the Scripture, she's widowed. You know they had no Social Security, no network like that back in the day. Evidently she had no family network. And she's got a son who's too young to work. He's probably a you know, middle school, elementary school, whatever age boy. And he can't help out. So here's what God just told Elijah this time. You're going to enemy territory. And this woman who's got one last little bowl of flour and just a little olive oil, uh, she's going to make you food. Okay. Well, that, the story doesn't end there. So first these red tail hawks are going to drop some, drop some chicken nuggets on you twice a day. And then this widow who has nothing, she is absolutely destitute, she's going to provide for you. Okay. Well, put yourself on the story. Imagine you're now the widow. And, and Elijah says to you, he sees you by the well, and he says, hey, uh, ma'am, could, could you give me a drink of water? She says, well, sure. I mean, just being neighborly, right? So she gives him some water. And as she starts to go back to her home, hey, could, could you give me, like, something to eat, some lunch? And she says, well, you know, I'd love to, but I only have enough left for us to have one meal. And she's so destitute, she really believes this is her last meal. And, and we're just going to die, me and my son. And Elijah says, you, you make me the meal first, and then God will provide for you more meal and more oil. Now think about that. Because she said, your God, not, not my God, your God. So here's what Elijah just told the widow. A God you've never seen and you've never heard has told me to tell you that if you do this, he'll take care of you. Does this seem a little unusual to you? Birds of prey, a widow, and a God you've never seen and currently don't even worship, he'll provide. Now see, sometimes when we read our Bible, it's easy to kind of think, well, that was a long time ago and far away. What do you think about your, uh, your story? Let me give you a couple of quick ones uh, <clears throat> in my life, how God's provided in unusual ways. So a few years ago, my oldest daughter lived in Houston, Texas. She gave birth to our first grandchild. So suddenly Houston had a real magnet for me and my wife to draw us to Texas, right? And uh, the grandkids are now, a few, there's four, not just one, and they're old enough to talk and all that, so they called her Grana. Grandma suddenly had a magnet from Fayetteville to Houston, right? And we had, Marcia and I, my wife Marcia and I, we had flown somewhere. Couldn't even tell you where to this day. But we were in the airport coming back. You know how they oversell 
plane, uh, pl seats on planes. And so the ticket agent in the particular uh, place we were at, uh, he or she came on the intercom and said, you know, hey, we've oversold tickets, and if five of you will volunteer to go on the next flight, we'll give you a voucher for you know, like 200 bucks or something. Well, I had something I had to get back for at the college. So it didn't entice me. I had to get back to do something that night. We're good. <clears throat> well, they didn't, have an, they didn't have enough takers. So they came back on the intercom a little bit later and said, hey, and they sweetened the deal. It was like now 500 bucks. And a couple of people went up. Well, they didn't need to sweeten the deal enough because they needed more. So this time they said 750 And Marcia, again, my wife, said, she's saying, hey, I don't have to get back for anything at the college. Maybe I'll do that. So before she got up there, a couple of people went up to the front to the ticket counter. It's like, oh, well, missed that opportunity. We get on the plane, and we're like row, uh, about fifth row. We were pretty close to the front, like five C and D. Uh, as you're looking at the cockpit, right side, I'm on the aisle, she's right next to me. And the ticket agent stuck her head in and she said, we still need one more. First person that will bump you to the next flight, thousand dollar voucher. Marsha's like, <laughs> okay, kid you not. So she gets off and I stay on. Remember I got something at the college that night. And uh, I fly as you have to. You realize that when the Lord Jesus raptures the church, we go through Atlanta first. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is when you fly, right? And so I fly through Atlanta and then Atlanta to Fayetteville. And I land in Fayetteville, <clears throat> and literally, I am not kidding, folks. I'm going down the escalator to the baggage claim, and I get a text. And the text is from my wife. And she says, stay at the, at the airport. I'm on the next flight, and I'll be there soon okay <laughs> so I literally waited 10 minutes on my baggage went out to the parking paid the ticket for my parking or whatever pull around to the curb 10 minutes later da -da, she, there she's there now think about this a 40 minute delay $1,000 she went to Houston three times for free <laughs> now that's kind of unusual yes another quick story so uh Years and years ago, Pastor Brian mentioned I interimed here back in 2000 and whatever it was, five or six or somewhere in there. My oldest child was in college. I had two more who were coming up to be going to college in the not too distant future. Well, before I became uh, associated with the college, I planted a church in Moore County. I don't know what you know about church planting that's starting a brand new church, but it doesn't pay well. Yes? Okay. Well, that's not true. This side of eternity doesn't pay well. <laughs> i got to make that distinction. But I had had zero, like as in zero opportunity to save up for kids' college funds, right? And uh, I'm at the college, and, and the college was small and struggling, and they're doing basically the same as what the church is doing as far as my salary goes. And I get this call from somebody at Liberty Church. I say, hey, hey would you be our interim? Oh, Sure. And anyway, all that to say, short story shorter, or long story shorter, over the next 10 years when my three children were going through college, God opened doors for me to do interim preaching at four different churches. And it was just always enough money to pay for their, whatever they needed at college. Now that's kind of unusual, right? Anybody out there, right? Can somebody say right or yes or something? Okay. So, so. In uncertain times, he says, tr God says, trust me, okay? And not always do we, but when we do, he says, I'm going to provide in ways that just might kind of surprise you. Through birds, through a widow who has nothing, through a God that you've never seen or even talked to. So here's my homework for you. I'm an incurable teacher. I'm assuming that you're going to have lunch today. Y'all are getting better. Good, good. So here's your assignment for lunch today. If you're married, with, if you're having lunch with your spouse, if you have children that's still at the home or grandkids or whoever you're having lunch with, here's your lunchtime conversation. Talk about the times, some of the times that God has provided in the most unusual way. Because your spouse, your kids, your grandkids need to hear those stories. They're faith builders. 
And you think, well, that, they know the story. Trust me, either they don't know the story or it's a good reminder to hear the story again. All right? Well, <clears throat> one last thought for you on this. Oh, by the way, here's, a, here's another thought. I, well, yeah, let me give you the last one, which is in uncertain times, obedience precedes blessing. I'll say it again. In uncertain times, obedience precedes blessing. So look in verse uh, 3. Go away from here, turn eastward, hide yourself by the brook Kirith. Da -da -da, it tells him some more things I provided. I'm going to command the ravens to do this for you. What's the very first three words of verse 5? What does it say? First three words of verse 5. So he went. All right? Here's what you don't hear or see Elijah doing. You don't hear him saying something like this. Lord, if you'll have those ravens drop a couple of nuggets on me here, then I'll go there. Just to prove you can do it here, then I'll go there. No, he goes there. And then what does God do? Drops the meat out for the ravens. Great. Well, look in verse uh, 6. So we went. Okay, we got that. Verse, the, you know, the ravens, the brook dries up. Verse 9. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Stay there. I commanded a widow to provide for you there. Again, you'll notice that Elijah does say, well, wait a minute, Lord. I don't know that I could trust the impoverished widow to be my meal ticket, so why don't you prove it now? First, depends on your Bible translation, five words of verse 10. So he arose and went. Huh. By the way, you never see Elijah deliberating or saying, eh, let me pray about that, and I'll get back to you next week, Lord. So he went. So he went. You see a pattern starting to develop here? Okay. Well, <clears throat> look in verse uh, 13. Elijah said to her, this is the widow, do not fear, and you, you know the story. Do what I've asked you to do. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the bowl of, your, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor the bowl of oil be empty, till the day the Lord sends rain upon the face of the earth. And so she said, well, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you next week. What's the very first three words of the next verse? So she went. By the way, when I teach how to study the Bible, the courses here or other places, one of the things you'll notice is you, when God repeats things, He wants you to get it. Now, if He doesn't repeat it, He still wants you to get it. But He realizes sometimes we're solo learners, and so He says, so He went, so He went, so she went. Maybe three times God's saying, you know what? I want you to see this pattern of obedience. So... <clears throat> Elijah goes to the brook. He gets food after the fact. He goes to Zarephath. She feeds him. She makes the cake for him first. Then God provides more flour and more oil for her and her family until the drought is over. Obedience always precedes blessing. Here's what God's saying to you through this last point. You obey me and then watch me work not in reverse you obey me and watch me work now here's our tendency at least it's my tendency god when you provide x then i'll do y i hate to be the bearer of bad news you realize we're kind of getting close to tax season y'all know this okay and so because your income is on your mind if you're in taxes and you got to report what you made last year and so forth whatever it is that you have to report there pick that number and uh, the Lord's challenging you to do something, let's say, be more generous with your tithes and offerings here at Liberty. And so here's what we tend to do. Whatever that number is, just throw it in there. God, when you, when you raise my salary to, then I'll give more. No, you won't. I'm just going to be honest. No, you won't. If we don't give now, we will never give then. I, my budget has gone through the roof compared to when I was a young youth pastor. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And if I don't give then, I'm sure not going to give later. I'll just find more ways to spend it and call it a need. No, he says, you, you obey me now, and I'll bless you later. And it's not just about finances. It could be about anything. Lord, if you'll, if you'll give me the ability to preach like Chuck Swindoll, whoever your favorite person, if you'll give me the ability to preach like him, then I'll open my mouth and start preaching. 
I said, no, you just start preaching and maybe you'll get better at it. Just preach or teach or whatever God's called you to do. We live in some pretty chaotic days. And we're very ordinary people. We're like Elijah. But we have an extraordinary God who loves working through ordinary people. Now, in this great state of North Carolina, you'll, even if you didn't live in North Carolina, you know the name Michael Jordan, right? Most of you don't know him? <laughs> I got three of you said, yeah. Okay, so Michael Jordan, okay? So, <clears throat> you may not know this name, Stacy King. Let me give you a little bit about Stacy King. Stacy King played at the University of Oklahoma, which is where I grew up in that state. He was good enough in college basketball to be drafted in the first round of the 1989 draft, number six, okay? So here's what the general managers of that day were thinking, right or wrong. There's only five players, amateur players, in the United States and the world better than Stacy King. He's number six. And so the Chicago Bulls drafted him, 1989. Stacy King played six seasons for the Bulls. He averaged about five points a game. Never a stellar career. Okay. On March the 29th, 1990, so we're coming up on 33 years ago, Michael Jordan scored a career-high 69 points against the Cleveland Cavaliers. How many points? That's important. You've got to get that. 69 points by Michael. Great. After the game, they're interviewing Stacy King. And here's his quote about Michael. He's one in a million, one in a billion. I don't think we'll ever see a player like him again. He's probably the world's greatest player. I'll always remember this as the night Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> Is that a great line? Now, if you're, if you're challenging math, 69 plus is 70. He hit one lone free throw. Does Michael Jordan, did he, need Stacy King? No. <laughs> Does God need you? No. But in his great grace, he says, I'll use you. He didn't need Elijah, but he used Elijah. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But in his great grace, he says, I want to use you. Even in these uncertain times, or maybe even especially in these uncertain times, just trust me, and then watch me work. I'll provide in unusual ways. Oh, by the way, trust me first, then watch me bless. In a room this size, group this size, here's what I, here's what I think. Probably somebody here has never trusted in Jesus. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is John 6, 47, where Jesus said this. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes in me has everlasting life. Now, who's the speaker? Sunday school answer starts with a J. <laughs> Jesus, what is he offering? Everlasting life. What's the condition? Believe him for it. He said, I'm making you a promise. It's everlasting life. What do you have to do? Not walk an aisle, say Corbin's a great preacher. No, 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 no. Believe Jesus' promise, and he gives it to you. By the way, John's gospel uses the word believe a hundred times. What do you think he wants you to do? Believe. Jesus makes a promise. And because he's who he says he is, he's, a, he's the God who became man and always keeps his word, he's going to be faithful to that promise. There's only one condition on your part. Believe his promise, and he'll do it. So if you can't point to a time in your life when you understood and believed Jesus' promise for everlasting life, today's the day. Not, not tomorrow, today. I'll say the verse again. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes in me has everlasting life. Now for the vast majority of us, perhaps, you've, you've believed that promise. <clears throat> so then the challenge for you today is probably something like this. We live in some really uncertain times. Again, they're not uncertain to God, but from our perspective, they are uncertain. What's God calling you to trust Him to do? Whatever that is, may I encourage you to say in your heart, Lord, by your grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to trust you to do that. 
and then watch you do what you do best. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, though it's chilly and wet outside, it's warm and dry inside. Thank you for these dear folks at Liberty Church and their love for you. pray for two things this morning, Lord. One, for the man or woman who's here who's never trusted Jesus' promise for life everlasting, that they would make today the day that they cross that line from death to life, from hell to heaven, from alienation to, to you, to peace with you. Lord, I pray for the people, the many perhaps, who've already believed that promise, uh, that are struggling with uh, believing you in the midst of some pretty chaotic times and maybe some uncertainty in their own life about their future, their finances, or whatever it might be. Would you help them to, uh, to understand and believe <clears throat> that though things are uncertain in the culture, they are not uncertain with you. The same God who sits on the throne of the universe uh, can control things in our lives as well. Help us to trust you and then watch you supply in unusual ways and after we obey you. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Corver. We appreciate you being here today. Um, we're so glad you're here with us today. And as Dr. Corver just mentioned, if you have not made a decision to follow Christ, uh, today is the day of salvation. If you would like to talk more about that and, and following Jesus, I'll be down at the front. Dr. Corver will be here and others. Uh, please come and talk with us. Uh, the rest of you, uh, we're so thankful that you're all here today and hope you have a wonderful week. You are loved. You're dismissed. <laughs>